there. Uh, I started a group years ago. Uh, Dane Waters uh, suckered me into it. Uh, called Citizens in Charge. And our goal is to expand initiative and referendum uh, in the United States. 26 of the 50 states, so a little over half, have initiative or referendum. Many of them have both. A majority of the cities in the country have some form of initiative, referendum, recall. Uh, nothing at the national level. No direct democracy at the national level. Uh, so that's kind of the, the playing field that we have. And the goal with Citizens in Charge was to primarily expand the process. And everybody in the United States loves democracy. If you ask them, you ask any politician, you ask any citizen, do you like democracy? I love it. I am for democracy. But maybe we have to define what democracy means because if you're for democracy when you win, well everybody is for democracy when they win. If you're for democracy, truly, you have to be for democracy when you lose the vote. And that's the rub because the public supports democracy but most elected officials frankly do not. And uh, one way I, I kind of notice the difference between people who are super political, like me, and like I think most of us in this room, but in the United States, <coughs> when I'm talking to someone at a barbecue or a dinner party, I will talk about direct democracy. And they will almost always think about what issues do I care about most and does it help me win? Or am I maybe winning on those issues and now I could lose? And the difference I see is that in the people who are most into politics, if direct democracy means they lose on their key, most important issues, they're against it. But most people who are not, you know, don't live and breathe 24 hours a day politics, they will do the same calculation. Oh, I could lose on that key issue I want. But I can't tell you how many times that sort of person will then say, but it's the right way, it's the right process, it's only fair. That's real support in democracy, particularly direct democracy. And so every election cycle, uh, we will see in, in the states, initiatives winning and of course they're almost always by the nature of this process they're almost always initiatives that the legislature doesn't like because if the legislature liked them they'd do it and you wouldn't have to have the initiative so come january you know there are elections are in november come january when the legislatures come back into session my email just starts a steady stream of did you see this new legislation that will gut, meaning kill, destroy, the initiative process in our state? Because the folks in the legislature don't want to lose. They want to make all the decisions. And um, the process itself is incredibly popular. We've done polls in all of the 50 states. I've seen numerous polls, even ones we didn't do, in state after state after state, I've never seen any poll that doesn't show at least a two to one level of support among the, the population for initiative and referendum. So the elected officials know this and they don't, with, with one exception, they, they, they don't suggest let's abolish this process because that'd be politically very dicey, very tricky for them. There's one legislator that I always remember, his name is Frank Chow. He's in Washington State and I remember him because, although I disagree with him, he's an honest politician. He introduced legislation to abolish the initiative process in Washington State. Now it didn't go anywhere, but he was honest. I don't like this process, I don't want the people to have this power. What usually happens 
is that they say, oh, we love, we love this process. We're all for it, but we just want to fix it a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in, in English, fix has some interesting meanings because it can mean to repair something, can also mean to put the fix in, which is uh, mo more where uh, some mobster wants that person, uh, uh, you know, killed. Now I've put the fix in. So um, they want to fix the process, and I think it's the latter way, uh, almost always. <coughs> And what they have done is to pass all kinds of regulations that just make it almost impossible to use. Uh, on the uh, uh, Taiwan democracy train, I gave a little talk and I mentioned my home state of Arkansas, where it used to be that if you were hiring petition circulators, you could get on the ballot for maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars, which is frankly a lot of money. Uh, now the cost is around a million dollars. And the reason is simple. The legislature passed a law that requires you to get a criminal background check from the state police and from the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, for every petitioner you hire. Why? Because they're committing crimes all the time? No. No one's been charged with any crime in the petition process. No one's been prosecuted. No one's been convicted. But just to be safe, we better require you to do this. Well, that's $38 every time you do it. And it's just, it, to me, it's just so offensive that you would, in essence, assume that if you're going to be part of this process and take a job collecting signatures, that you're probably a crook. Um, so just the, just the feelings from it is obnoxious, not even counting on the cost. But they've, they've done other things too. For instance, they, it used to be that they required the state, anytime you have a measure on the ballot, to print in newspapers around the state the language of the initiative. Well, it makes sense, so people can see it, although, you know, back when only newspapers, you know, newspapers were the way everybody got their news, it made a lot more sense than today when hardly anyone's getting their news from the newspapers. They're getting it from radio and TV and the internet and social media. But what that means is that even if you gather all your petitions, you don't happen to be wealthy people. Maybe what you're doing doesn't, doesn't attract a lot of money, but you have people power you can get all your petitions with volunteers, not spending a nickel, but then you have to pay to print it throughout the state. Well, that last time uh, I was involved in an initiative, that was $25,000. And it was a very short, succinct initiative. If you had a longer initiative, that might be $100,000 or more. Um, you know, it's hard to get people all riled up about oh, we have to print this thing in the newspaper because they're thinking, you know, this is a detail. But it means that direct democracy is expensive and not available to people who don't have money. It's, it's, uh, it's not really democracy for sale, it's democracy at a very high price. Um, and now they have a measure on the ballot in Arkansas that the people will get to vote on because they're amending the state constitution that moves the deadline from July to January. Now, what's the difference? July, January, and to run a campaign against it, which we're going to attempt to do, it's, it's tough to explain that difference, but the difference is gigantic. In January, it's very, very cold. And it's very <coughs> tough to get people to go out in the cold, and of course you have Christmas right before then, where a lot of professional circulators who travel the country, they want to be home for Christmas, not in Arkansas. Uh, in July, you have July 4th, a big celebration where there's people everywhere. And, and one of the problems we have in gathering signatures is that increasingly stores won't let you do it there. Even government uh, offices oftentimes are located in private shopping centers and then they say, oh, no, you can't petition outside the government office because it's on private property. So, you know, these, these sorts of restrictions 
um, are very difficult, I think, for the average person to really appreciate, but they're devastating to the process, and the cost just keeps going up and up. I just want to mention a, a couple others that are, are interesting. In Florida, they just passed a measure that you can't pay pet petition circulators on the number of signatures that they gather. So that if you say, hey, I'll pay you a dollar for every signature you gather, with the intention being, I don't want you to just, you know, sit around, I want you to go ask people, well, that's illegal. You have to pay them on an hourly basis. And of course, what that means is, if I'm being paid every hour, well, maybe, maybe it's a little hot outside, I'll take a break. Or I'll stand in the shade and see if anybody walks by. But if I'm, if I'm being paid per signature, and I have worked when I was much younger as a paid circulator, and I can tell you, every time someone signed, I'm calculating that's one more dollar for my family. And you go on to the next person, and you're encouraged to go on because the amount of hard work you put in, you get more money. Under their system, it doesn't matter. And what it does is it dramatically increases the cost. In fact, the sponsor of that measure admitted that the biggest effect it would have is to make the process more expensive. And then when he was asked, you're doing this because you're concerned about fraud, are you aware of any fraud whatsoever in the process? His answer was, I have no idea. I have no idea. But then he pointed out that there was bank fraud when people were being given uh, bonuses for signing up more customers, which was a scandal in the U.S. But of course, his legislation doesn't deal with banks. And then he said, well, the Russians, they spent money in our elections. We have to fight these things before they happen. I mean, this is ridiculous. But these are the sorts of things. It is a fig leaf because they can't just come out and say, we want to destroy your rights. We want to take away your rights. That just doesn't sound very good. But fighting fraud, even though they don't have a clue that there's any fraud, and in fact there is very, very little in the process, that's the sort of things they do. Uh, uh, two years ago in Ohio, there was a commission they set up to suggest how to make changes. And one of the changes they suggested was we want to have a supermajority for any constitutional amendment. And of course, the difference between a statute, in most of the states you can do a statute, which is a simple law, or you can amend the state constitution. The big difference is, if you amend the state constitution, the legislature can't change it without going back to the voters to change it. If you pass a simple statute, you win, and then the first time that they can muster a majority in the legislature, they can kill the whole, the whole law. But they wanted this supermajority to protect the Constitution, but only for measures proposed by citizens. If it was proposed by the legislature under this, their proposal, well, that's just a simple majority. But if the citizens petition it onto the ballot, it needs to be a 60% majority. In North Dakota, they, they have a bill and they have an amendment now on the, on the ballot in 2020. The bill said that after citizens pass the constitutional amendment, it goes back to the legislature, and the legislature can approve it <coughs> or say no. So they work for us, but if we pass a law and put it in our fundamental law, they're going to be a, a, a gatekeeper who says no. Now, they got enough flack on that that they changed it to be if we pass a law, a constitutional amendment, it goes to the legislature, and if the legislature says no, then it goes back to the ballot. Now, much better than their original proposal, but I submit if the people pass a law, the legislature works for the people. My group is called Citizens in Charge for a reason, because the whole fundamental idea of democracy is that citizens are the sovereigns and that legislators work for us and represent us. We're the boss, they're not the boss. And this put, just completely turns that on its head. So how do you fight these things? 
it's very, very difficult. And I thought one of the things you mentioned about uh, tying the different issues, I think you have to be very careful. One of our biggest impacts in fighting some of these things, and we've been pretty successful in building coalitions left, right. You know, sometimes I'm on a conference call, and the first time we hold a call in the state because we've got some legislation threatening the process, you know, everyone's a little scared to talk because the other people on the call might be someone they worked against in the last election. Um, but the more they talk, the more they will say, hey, you know, the Democrats on the call will say, I'll go talk to the Democrats. And the Republicans on the call will say, I'll go talk to the Republicans. So we've had good effect in building these left-right coalitions to publicize it. And usually we can stop these bad bills by simply making it public enough that the legislators realize, uh-oh, the, the people are going to know what we're doing. But oftentimes if there are uh, powerful interests behind it who are willing to spend big money, all of a sudden it's much tougher for us to stop it because the legislators know these groups are going to be there on election day supporting me and the direct democracy movement doesn't have the money to be writing big checks on election day or leading up to election day. So um, it's really important I think to build that broad coalition. At the same time I came to the issue of direct democracy really through term limits, limiting how long politicians can stay in office. Without direct democracy I mean, forget about it. There's, there's not going to be legislatures running around going, oh, that's a great idea. I should limit how much power I have. And so we have to have initiative and referendum. And the public gets it. Let me just finish this. Uh, the public gets that. And, I, and I'll, I'll explain kind of how, in, in a great instance, we had uh, lobbied to put two measures on the ballot in one state, Oklahoma. And one of them was term limits for all statewide officials. And the other was to make the initiative process easier by reducing how many signatures you had to get. In the polling, the term limits one had 75%. It's a winner. You don't have to spend a nickel. People are going to read the ballot title. They're going to vote yes. Our measure, the polling was like 47 yes, 49 no. Uh, it, and it wasn't clear that they had any real understanding. So I was able to raise just a little bit of money and put radio ads on in the last four days of the campaign, which is, is not enough usually to make much difference. But the ads we ran talked about term limits. We ran an ad in favor of term limits, even though we didn't need anything to win that. And then it was a 60 second radio spot and the first 30 seconds was about term limits and then the second 30 seconds was about and vote for measure, you know, one was 75, vote for measure 75, term limits, rah, rah, and then vote for 76. It's about your initiative rights to do things like term limits. And one of the beauties of term limits is people get that, boy, this is an issue politicians aren't going to do so we have to have this process and so on election night I staying up late we're we're losing by just a little tiny bit and of course this ad campaign did not reach the whole state so we didn't think it would probably be enough but throw a little pass hope it hope somebody catches it and right before I went to bed at about 1 a.m. I hit refresh on my on the computer screen and we ended up winning that with 50.1% of the vote against 49.9. <laughs> but, but the people needed that connection. And when I first got involved in direct democracy and lobbying legislators, I knew how much they hated term limits. And I tended to hide my involvement. When we ran a campaign in one state, I, I did nothing publicly because I figured if they see me, then, they, then they're going to think term limits. And I now realize that was a mistake, that they're not going to like the initiative. They don't like a lot of things. We've got to, we've got to activate the people. And, and just to close, we've got to get people to understand that no matter how much they might agree with you on, you know, some elected official agrees with you on taxes or abortion or health care or foreign policy or whatever, 
if they don't support your fundamental right to direct democracy, they cannot possibly represent you. And it's a proof that you're talking. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs>